Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our service. As uh, I've been getting reports from John as to who is sick and who is not sick. I said this morning we'll be slim pickings this morning. <laughs> but I, my, my prayer is that while we will miss the many who are not here because of illness, you notice that Kim is doing double duty, Dwayne is doing double duty this morning, but I'm thankful that you're here and that we are here to meet with God, not necessarily to meet with one another, and I am glad that you are here from the children to the oldest person, and may God bless you. We welcome those who are meeting with us online and those who are at home because of illness. We greet you in Christ's name and trust that the service this morning will be rich with God's blessing and encouragement to all of us. As I said, double duty, so I'm giving the announcements this morning. <laughs> this afternoon at four o'clock, we have our prayer time. We encourage you to come, and if you cannot come, and you can think, oh, it's four o'clock, they're praying, just take a moment at home and pray and ask God to bless the ministry of the church so that uh, we will be praying with and for one another. We will be doing a brand new thing. I said, brand new thing. There are countries in the world where they don't have a Bible. And so what, the, what our denomination is doing, they're asking you beginning next week to bring your unused Bibles. You know, most of you have how many Bibles? You can't count them on one hand. Um, at home, if you're not using them, if they're just um, on your desk or your, your shelves, and you would like to donate them, there will be a, um, I w there will be something under the table in the foyer for you to um, to put them in, and we'll be collecting Bibles through the month of uh, October, and until the 12th of November. That's when we have an, our annual conference. So please remember that. We'll re be reminding you again. Unused Bibles, and new or old, just bring them, and we will use them. This coming um, Wednesday is our soup supper, and we are inviting you to come and join with us. It's a grand time of just sitting and enjoying one another's company, as well as enjoying some nice food. Uh, you are invited. Then at 7 o'clock, we have our Bible study and prayer. This coming Wednesday, we'll be studying from Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 52, where Jesus walks on water. So please remember um, that. And uh, next Sunday, I hope that everyone will be back. We'll be receiving two new members into the congregation. I'm looking forward uh, to that. Then um, in your bulletin, you have an announcement for October 8th. That, that is not correct. It should be the beyond next week. The church council is the... Um, the week, October, fourteen. October fourteen is our is our council meeting, and our council meeting is where members as well as non as non members come to hear how the church is doing. It's the state of the church, perhaps that's the best way to put it. So if you can come, it's going to be on a Saturday morning from ten to twelve. And we met yesterday morning for a planning committee meeting, and we were out by quarter to 12, so we did very well uh, yesterday, and I hope to keep it the same on the 14th of um, October. And now for the ladies' announcement, Lori. Um, good morning. Good morning. Just a couple announcements. One is to remind the women that Operation Christmas Child uh, is coming to our church. Um, Vanessa Hutchinson will be here to share her story as a recipient in Honduras when she was a little girl of uh, the Operation Christmas Child shoebox and how that affected her life. Please come, please enjoy the evening. Um, also, we will, as a church, um, if you would like to participate with the shoebox ministry this year, we will be doing that, and not as a um, receiving center, but as a, hopefully you can share that with your family, your grandchildren, your children, and do this ministry with us. 
Okay. Um, upcoming women's ministries. Again, there is a bookmark. Please pick one up so you know what's going on in our church. And um, it's also, Kim puts it on the website. Um, so everyone is always invited. I have an announcement about these wonderful apples out on this, on this door over here. They are eating apples, just fresh, good for children, juicy, and wonderful, I'm told. So please pick those up and enjoy those from Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. I think those are the announcements. Like I said, many of our folks are down with the flu this, this week. John, Warren, and... Uh, um, Randy. Uh, Brendan? Anyway, there are others, and uh, do pray for, for them for God's speedy recovery. Uh, Leonard, I don't know, he's not here. We haven't heard from him uh, this week, and so please be in prayer for them. Let's make the transition. Paul is going to come and call us to worship. Praise God. So good to see each one of you. Uh, we're going to read from Psalm chapter 18. And so, why don't you stand with me, please, as we read. <clears throat> Great words here. Let's think about these words as we read them. Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from, from my enemies. Verse 46, the Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Amen. Thank you.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Children, you are dismissed to go to your session. I'm going to do something a little bit differently this morning. Could we have that song we just sang just now, the last verse? Is it possible to do that? Ah, thank you. He shall return, we believe that. In robes of white, we believe that. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, we believe that. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Do you see what's missing in that song? I guarantee you that most of you will not even notice it. The ascension that Jesus is right now presently in heaven doing something. That's what I'm speaking on this morning. And I never noticed until we were singing this song. And every part of that song is right, but it, it, it traced the life of Christ from, from Calvary's cross to the empty tomb to heaven, and it's coming again, but says nothing about the ascension, what he's doing right now. And you know what he's doing right now? The scripture says, that Jesus is in heaven interceding for us right now. That makes life worth living. And um, I thought I'd share that with you as you will see how it, um, when you get the introduction to the message before the message. Let's pray. Thank you.
O great God, the one who knew us before we were born, even before we were in our mother's womb, you knew us. How can we fathom that wisdom, that power, that knowledge? We can't. But each day we live, we become aware that you wrote our life story, life story before we were born, our coming and our going, where we would be born, how we would uh, live life uh, for better or for worse. And that gives us the opportunity to come to the one who created us fearfully and wonderfully made us so that we can come on each Lord's day to reflect upon his goodness, his greatness, his power, his majesty, his foreknowledge, everything, Lord, that your word teaches, we give you thanks. Lord, we need to have a fresh understanding of this today. As we are talking about the ascension, we're talking about the, the ministry of Christ right now. There might be those who have come into this place today with doubts, with fears, with pressures, and wonder how they could face another week, how they could finish this day. Jesus is praying for you. And Lord, help us to understand that Jesus does not pray empty prayers. He is in the presence of God where he ever lives at no moment are we out of his prayers before the Father. And he has promised that his peace will keep us. And I pray that the sense of your majesty your power, your glory will fill this place this morning. Father, sure we miss our many friends that are not here this morning, but how much worse it would be if you were not here. And so help us to acknowledge who you are, that you are with us. You have promised never to leave us, nor to forsake us. You have promised to be with us in all our affliction, so that we have the presence of God when we wake up and when we put our heads on our pillows. And we gather this morning, we gather this morning that we might hear from you and that you will make a difference in how we face tomorrow. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, we do want to um, welcome the world travelers back from where they were last month, and uh, I have been the recipient of their generosity. I have been the, um, the recipients of their generosity, and uh, so I didn't mind. I should just share a very, a very interesting incident with you. I was coming back from my daughter on a Friday afternoon, a little bit distraught because of the, the situation with the banks and, and so on, and. Uh, I was a little bit annoyed, and I got behind this truck, and I thought, that looks like Carl and Kathy. And I, before they left, they had a ladder that they used to walk up to their, and I said, that is Carl and Kathy. And I drove by them. I wasn't speeding, the, the traffic was out. <laughs> And uh, sure enough, it was Carl and Kathy, and that made my day, you know, so I, I thank God for them. Well, having said that, that you shared a bit of my past week, let's sing one of our favorite songs, He Will Hold Me Fast, remain seated for that song.
Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail. He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful paths. For my love is often gold. He must hold me fast. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Hallowed be your name, the true and living God, the God of all creation. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, we come before you to pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for your mercies as you watched over us and brought us safely through this last week. Lord, thank you. And now, Lord, we ask for your mercy, for your very presence, very presence in our midst as we worship at this time. Lord, please minister to special needs amongst us. 
that only you know and understand. Lord, we pray for the sick. We think of those that are not, are not with us this morning. We think of Brother John. Bring healing, touch his body. Bless John and Emma. Pray for Brother Warren. Pray for uh, your healing touch there. Bless Brother Warren and Roseanne. And we, and we think of uh, Art and Doris, Lord. Bring healing, healing to their bodies. And touch them. And uh, think also of Brother Leonard and Cora. Bless them. Bring healing and encouragement there. Thank you for each one of these people, Lord. We love them. They love you. Bring healing, God. Father, we um, think of uh, your, your church, the ministry of your church in this place as we reach out and uh, are effective reaching our neighbors in this community, Lord. Lord, we pray for our missionaries. We think of Brother Kevin Nelson and his wife Debbie in the Ukraine. Uh, Lord, uh, watch over them as they would serve you at this time, seeking to bring, bring others to Christ in a very dangerous place. Um, we pray for, uh, Lord, our conference superintendent, Brother Brian Hotram. Uh, tremendous, tremendous challenges in uh, his work, even at this time. Bless Brother Brian and his wife, Donna Lynn, Lord. Father, we, we pray, we pray for our, our government, both the federal government and the local government. Lord, we pray that, that those men and women would acknowledge you and your authority your, your, your authority as, as God, and they would want to serve you in the places that you've put them, that they would serve you in the fear of the Lord. Oh, God, speak to them. And now, Lord, uh, we want to thank you. Thank you for the uh, offering that will be received at the end of this service. And thank you for that, and thank you for your blessing. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, will you turn, please, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. And please turn for the reading of God's Word as Haley comes to read to us from Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Please stand. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. <laughs> Over us. 
Oh God, teach us what we do not know. Make us what we have not been. Take us where we have not been. In the depths of the scripture that speaks of this great theme, forgive us for ignoring it, but help us, Lord, not to be guilty from this day on as we think of what Jesus is doing now on our behalf in this crazy world we're living in. We thank you that we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roar, fast and deep, deep in the Savior's love. And Father, what he's doing now on our behalf we give you thanks in his name. Amen. We celebrate Christmas, and rightly so. We celebrate Easter, and rightly so. We celebrate Thanksgiving, and rightly so. We celebrate our birthdays, and rightly so. And I wonder why this one theme of the ascension is almost ignored by most churches and denominations. I looked at some of our more modern hymn books, and I looked at one especially that I'm thinking of right now, and there's not one, not a song about the ascension of Jesus, not a song. And I, I wondered why, as, as if when Jesus died and rose again, he just vanished, and we have no idea of where he may be, and that is not the case. But not only that, not only do we have an absentee Lord physically, but his ascension made it possible for us not to ever live with an absentee Lord. We shall see this in a few moments. And I wonder if sometimes the defeat that we feel in our Christian life is because we are ignoring what Christ is doing presently for us at this moment. You know, I, I, I was saying about um, the bank. Um, I think the next thing they'll, they'll call and ask what time I go to bed. I mean, they wanted to ask questions about checks that I have written and, and to whom are they going. And, and, uh, and, and there is one of those checks that I'm, I write every month and they want to know, to whom is this written? And I, oh, I said, no, you don't want me to tell you that because uh, I'll, I'll leave it like that. I'll tell you afterwards if you want to know. And those things can be discouraging. They can take the energy out of life. They can interfere with our progress. Jesus had an experience like this where he, he healed a man on the Sabbath day. And the Jews who lived by this legalism of the Sabbath day said, how are you doing that on the Sabbath? They could not look at what Jesus had done. They were concerned about he did it on the wrong day. So they never had the experience of experiencing the joy. And sometimes we can miss what Jesus has to do for us at the moment we're going through the valleys of the shadows of death, as it were. But because we are more concerned about going through the valley, we miss the one who is taking us through it. Do you remember what he said? Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what's the next words? I am with you. And so this morning, for the next few moments, I want to speak on the ascension. The, the word simply means to be taken up, to rise up. Every time you read about the ascension in the New Testament, it is someone going up, up, up. And I want to begin this morning with the history. Where, <coughs> excuse me, where did this come from? Who invented this idea of an ascension? 
It's, it's really a biblical, biblical term, if you please. And I take your attention back to Psalm 110 and verse 1. Psalm 110 and verse 1. It's, it's a psalm that blows the human mind. Because it begins like this. The Lord, Jehovah, God, said to my Lord, David is saying there was a sense in which he became party to a divine conversation between God the Father and God the Son. So when he said, the Lord, Jehovah, said to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for you. Way back in the eternities, how, how David was able to become party of this, we are not told, but the Holy Spirit is the one who gave him the understanding of what he was hearing. And what was, what was being done, this psalm is speaking about something that was going to take place almost two or three thousand years after David. And, and, and he's looking at what later on, in Acts chapter 2, verse 34, Peter is defending Pentecost. And he used this very passage to say, that is what is meant when David said, and Peter tied the whole thing together. By the way, there is a young preacher who is trying to get rid of the Old Testament, saying the Old Testament is, is passé, we don't need that. That is a devilish idea. Because Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, looked at the Holy Spirit's coming. David looked at it previously. Peter identified it. He took the, 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 that which was concealed in the Old Testament, as we used to say, is revealed in the New Testament. And he brought them together and he said, what we see happening here is because what was predicted in history from, Acts, from, from Psalm 110 is what is being done today. Jesus had not yet been born when this was, when uh, Psalm 110 was written. He had not yet been incarnate. But then he came and he lived and he died. And please listen. Jesus completed his redemptive work when he ascended. He came from heaven as a babe, returned to earth as a glorified man, and he said to his father, I have finished the work you have given me to do. Salvation does not end at the resurrection. It ends, the work of salvation, I should say, does not end with the resurrection. It ends at the ascension where Jesus returns to his father and he said to him, Father, I have finished the work you have given me to do. And you know what the father said? Let all the angels of God worship him. The ascension is not something we just pick up. The ascension is not something we put together for religious whatever we want to put it. The ascension, my friends, is something that was in the mind of God before the act itself, fulfilled in space and time, and as a result, we can say, uh, by the way, Dan Brown, the famous atheist, said that they have discovered the bones of Jesus somewhere in Spain. They may have discovered some bones, but not the bones of Jesus. Jesus is alive and is at the right hand of God. That, my friends, should excite us because it means that we are not facing these tremendous days we're living in ignorance and all alone. I want you to see not only the history of the ascension, I want you to see those present at the attention. The Bible teaches that everything should be verified by the witness of two or three witnesses. That's how the Bible 
one person cannot make a claim. You must have a, someone who witness with you. And I want you to look at the two witnesses of the ascension. In Luke chapter 24, verse 50, we read, He, Jesus, led them to Bethany. Who are the them? His disciples. Those who had been with him. Those who saw him in the month of transfiguration. Those who saw him walk on water. Those who saw him turn water into wine. Those who saw him heal a, a, a lame man. Those who saw him heal a dead, bring a dead uh, girl back to life. His disciples were eyewitnesses of the ascension. Peter is going to write later on. We were eyewitnesses of these things. They were not asleep. They were wide awake. They were led. They were following Jesus. And he took them to the place exactly where he was going to take off, if you please. And they saw it. And you know, it's, it's a, an amazing thing for me. In the past, Peter would have had something to say about that. Do you remember when Jesus said that he was going to die and go to the cross? Peter said, no, you won't. But when the ascension was taking place, what we're going to see in a minute, they stood there. There's no word for it. How can you explain something that is absolutely contrary to nature? But they were there. And they wrote about it for people who are suffering, as we were studying in our Sunday school class this morning. People who are suffering could take courage from the fact that there is one who is caring for them now. So Peter, James, John, all the disciples but Judas were witnesses to the ascension of Jesus. Those were the earthly witnesses but there were the heavenly witnesses. We had read to us this morning from Acts chapter 1, verse 10 we read, and there were two men. Now that word men is not anthropos as you and I think of it. Those two men in Luke, chapter tw Luke 24, 23 were called angels. They were heavenly beings the heavenly creatures that were created by Christ, and they knew him in glory. The angels knew Christ before he came on earth. And they celebrated his birth. And at his ascension, they reminded the disciples, this same Jesus whom you see taken up before you shall come again. So we have the earthly witnesses, the disciples, we have the heavenly witnesses, the angels. Imagine these created beings knowing Christ from heaven to earth. At this time, they are celebrating Christ from earth to heaven. The angels were there. They could not be mistaken. Because they knew Christ when he was incarnate. And now they're seeing Christ as he's glorified. And so we have the two witnesses that we can point to from earth and from heaven. What I wish to show you, my friends, that the event is more than a story. It is an act, an event that truly took place in space and time. Let me suggest to you the uniqueness of Christianity Every other religion begins at earth and ends on earth. Christianity begins in heaven to earth and back to heaven. You and I are connected to another world, a real world where Jesus is. Paul, writing to the Colossians, said to them, you are hidden with Christ in God. 
Your life is hidden with Christ in God, in, in glory, even though you're here physically. Your true self is in heaven, and when Jesus comes, he will reveal who we really, really are. John, writing earlier, said, We do not know what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I wonder if that makes a difference to you this morning, friends. I wonder if it makes a difference to the way you look at what's happening in our world. That this is not, this is only a stop for us on our way home. Our true home is where we're going. And, and sometimes, you remember the old Negro spiritual that they used to sing? <coughs> this world is not my home. I am just a passing through. Well, you know the rest of it. I don't know the rest of it. <laughs> but that's what it is, friends. We are not just here passing time. We are here connected to where we, our citizenship really is, where Christ is. And as a result, we're here with a purpose. We're here with direction. We are here with a destiny. Because Jesus said to the disciples, if I go away and come again, I will receive you unto myself. The rest of it, that where I am, there you may be also. That's our destiny. Where Jesus is, is where you and I are destined for. Not the grave. Not the tomb. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let's, let's look at my second point, the mystery. The mystery of the ascension and its mystery from beginning to end. The ascension is what is given to us in, in two of the Gospels. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, it is given to us in Mark chapter 16 and verse 19. In Mark 16 and 19. And, and it tells us this in Mark 16 and 19, which, which I better turn to. In Mark 16, 19. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up in heaven. And I'll just stop there for now. He was received up. As Jesus was standing on the, 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 the mount in Bethany, he began to ascend. That means that he was defying gravity. That gravity could not hold him down. He was, he was seen taken up before them. And that's why they were standing there with with their jaws dropping. And the two angels said, why are you standing looking that way? Don't you understand that this is the Son of God with power? He walked on water. He turned water into wine. He raised the dead. He calmed the sea. Do you think that gravity could stop him from going where his destiny is? No. And we need to grasp this again, that when we think of the ascension, we are thinking, and here, my friends, a beautiful picture of what happens to the Christian when he or she dies. When the Christian dies, the scripture says, God welcomes them. From where they die, they go pass through time and gravity, and their spirit is taken back to the one who redeemed them, and there we are told, Jesus said, you shall ever be with the Lord. He, he defied gravity. You and I defied gravity. I remember when uh, her name slips me now. 
died a few months ago. Um, Tina can tell me her name. Doris. 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 Yes, yes. I, I was with in the in the room with her just a few minutes before um, she was taken out, and and then a few days died. And and uh, she was unafraid or unashamed of making it known that she loved Jesus and Jesus loved her. I mean, she didn't hold anything back. Here was this Jewish doctor, and she was letting him know. And I'm sitting there, you know, I, I want to be a little bit reserved and respectful for the Jewish faith, and, and she could not, she couldn't care less. And she said to me with the Jewish doctor sitting there, Pastor, I want to go back to the apartment to say goodbye to my friends. And I want, I, I want to die in the apartment before my friends. And really what I want to do is to die there. And the first person when I, when I get to heaven, how was she going to get there? Jesus preceded her. The first person when I get there I want to see is Jesus. And then I want to see my parents. And I want to see Lois. <laughs> what confidence that, that she was going to be taken. Nothing was going to stop her from reaching her destiny as she had been given that promise by the one who preceded her. And so the ascension, my friends, speaks not only of the reality in Christ, but it speaks of you and me. When you and I die, we too will, will defy gravity. We too will overcome whatever would stop us. And, and you know, it's, it's, in, it's interesting. Forgive me for doing this. I haven't done this in a while. But when Lois was, was, was struggling with, with life and, and, and so on, and... Uh, the, the, the hospice nurse said, I've, I'm scheduled to, be, to see her tomorrow, but I don't think I will be needed. And it, she knew what she was talking about because in about an hour after that, she was gone. But I remember, please forgive me for this, but it's so real. As, as the, the fellow from the, the funeral home came and, and they gave us a few minutes before they took her out, I realized that this was only a shadow of what it will be. Only a shadow. She's not there. That body was no longer. That's the body I used to love. <laughs> but what God loves even more is with him. She defied gravity and she was taken that moment, that moment, right into the presence of God. Jesus did it. And so will everyone who dies in Christ. But he did not only defy gravity. Colossians chapter 2 tells us that he divided authority. He divided divide authority. What do I mean? Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Jesus Christ, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities... He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. In other words, Jesus had to pass through in the ascension. He had to pass through the domain of spiritual wickedness. Angels who had been put into subjection until their final destruction. We, they're called spiritual darkness. They are called wicked spirits. They would definitely oppose Jesus from reaching his destiny. Because if they could oppose him from reaching his destiny, they couldn't do it keeping him from the cross. So perhaps they could do it by keeping him from reaching heaven. No, he made a public display of them. He triumphed over them. He passed through. And when, I don't know, please allow me some space here with my sanctified imagination that when Jesus was being ascended and those spiritual wickedness saw him as he made his way there instead of trying to, to, to reach out to stop him. Do you remember at the cross 
when they came to, defy, to, to arrest Jesus, and Jesus asked her, whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And what did he say? I am. And what happened to them? They all fell on their faces. My friends, that's what happened in the heavenlies, because that's where they are. They, nothing could stop them. Nothing could stop him. Not even gravity. Not even spiritual wickedness in high places, according to Ephesians chapter 2. That is what the ascension means. That the enemies of Christ were defeated. And because he defeated them in his glorified body and returned to his father, he has left that very same authority for you and me to overcome. And I don't need to go into some of my own experience with this in the past times, but I can tell you of times, my friends, when I have been confronted by the powers of evil and my one escape was that Jesus Christ is risen and seated at the right hand of God. That was my one escape. I am no match for the devil and his pinions. You are no match for him or them. But because Jesus Christ defeated them, you and I are assured of the same victory. Well, we have looked at his, uh, what, I, what I call in my notes here, the procedure. As he was ascending, look at what, what, is, what is being done. Luke tells us as he ascended, he raised his hand and he was blessing them as he was taken up into heaven where he was received. And I love this because that posture of blessing, it is, it is like when at the end of a service, I raise my hand and I say, the Lord bless you and keep you. When he was going back to heaven, he raised his hand and he didn't say the Father bless you. The Father, I bless you. I am giving you the authority with which I go to heaven for you to serve me on earth. You will not serve me in your own strength. You will serve me effectively because you are blessed with the blessings of my ascending authority. You will see this in, in, a, in a minute. It, it was a scene that is beyond human description, but you and I are in line with the apostles now because he gave it to them to give to the church, and you and I, you and I are recipients of that. I, I, don't, I, I said to someone, you know, I am... Um, my, my boy sent me yesterday, he, he got his Master's of Theology diploma yesterday, he graduated back in um, February, March sometime, and they had to <laughs> investigate his, his background to make sure he did it legally, and um, he did. And, and you know, it was, he, he sent me a picture of it, and, and one of the things I want to remind him, I want to remind him, Christopher, that certificate of Master of Arts of Theology does not qualify you to minister God's Word. You know what qualifies you? God's gift to you. God has gifted you to be able to use your mind, surrender it to Him, so that you will do physical things. Uh, he, he has been given the position of the executive director of a, of a non-profit organization in Seattle. But my friends, it was not, be educationally, that was true. But finally, that authority was given to him, not by the amount of degrees that he has, but by the gift that God has given to him. And he will use that degree for that purpose. He will not use it for any other purpose. And I say the same thing to myself. The schools I attended did not qualify me. They educated me. 
The qualification for ministry has to do with my sense of calling from God. And if he called me, he equips me, and I get to know him on a daily basis to truly keep me from thinking that it is my stuff and not anybody else's. Quickly, let's look secondly at the, his posture. And the reason I left Mark 19, uh, 16, 19, is because I want to finish it this way. He says, so then, when the Lord Jesus had when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. My friends, no human being, no matter, not Billy Graham, not Stephen Orford, not Charles Spurgeon, no other human being, no human being, might I put it this way, has that authority to sit at the right hand of God. Only one person, only Jesus. It means that God recognized the deity of his son to sit at his right hand. That's the place where God rules the universe. And he now sits at the right hand of the Father. And as you read the book of Revelation, they will, they will glorify him who sits upon the throne and the Lamb. Because he is there. The sitting posture, the sitting posture is a, is a position of completion. The, the, the priest in the Old Testament never sat down. They stood up all the time because their offering was not complete. When Jesus was finished with his, he was returned to heaven in his ascension and he sat down. You know, there's an interesting thing. I... I I mentioned I, I was in Ikea on, on Saturday afternoon. What a task. And I finally got home. I was here in the morning for a meeting at, at uh, 10 o'clock. Left and drove to uh, Albany to meet my kids. And we went to Ikea. And I'll tell you about that some other time if you need to know. I got, got back last night about 7 o'clock or whatever, I don't know. And when I got to bed, I sat in the bed and I thought, oh, man, this feels good. I'm telling you that, my friends, because that's what happens to us. When, when we sit down, it is almost to bring relief from a pressure-cooked day from difficulties with people, how they drive on the roads and so on. And we are exhausted. And so we relieve ourselves by sitting down. That's not what is meant by sitting down here. When Jesus sat down, it was, it is completed. Nothing else is needed. You can't add one one iota to the redemptive work of Christ. You can't work more, you can't pray more, you can't give more. Nothing, my friends. Jesus did exactly what God required for your salvation and mine. And when he sat down, he could say to his father, I have completed the work you have given me to do. We have someone who is there for whom the father is saying, when I see him, I see you. And what it was completed in him is being completed in you. And that day is coming. Let me quickly get to the ministry. The ministry. Uh, by the way, I, my notes, I should just read this. Look at Ephesians 1.19. And, and what he's talking about, that Jesus had to be a unique individual to do these two things. To sat da sit down, number one. And to go up, number two. He had to be unique. And so Peter, uh, Paul puts it this way. And that you might come to know what is the surpassing greatness of the power toward us who believe they are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. It's not talking about you and me. It's talking about Christ. He had to have power. Inherent power. 
and Paul didn't know how to finish it. He talks about the power of his might and the power. That's because, my friends, the power that is in Jesus Christ, the authority that is in Jesus Christ, surpasses human knowledge. Surpasses. So I come quickly to the ministry of the uh, ascension, the ministry. How does the ascension make sense to you and to me today? Made sense to the apostles. And this is how it is. Look at Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Mark 16, 20. 19 says this, So then, when the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up in glory, sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere. The ascension, my friends, is the motivation for sharing the gospel, to preaching the gospel, to living the life of a gospel-redeemed person. And they went out. He, he went up. Power came down. The Holy Spirit came. And again, Peter was able to identify this as something that is uniquely the work of God. And they went and preached. The word preach there doesn't mean they're doing what I'm doing. It means they went everywhere talking about the gospel at Walmart, at Target, at Walgreens. They didn't have that in those days, but whatever they had. Do you get this, friends? That the ascension people might ask you, how, how is it that you can, you can talk about someone that you have not seen? And that, that question is very easy. There are many, many things we talk about what we cannot see. For example, I talk about the queen, but I've never seen the queen. Someone says, yeah, but they have stories written about him. Well, what do you think this is? I have never seen Her Majesty. You know, when I was in England, you can tell that the queen is in residence when the Union Jack is flying. And, and someone told me that she was, the Union Jack was flying, and I said to Lois, that means that the queen is in residence. Well, how do I know that? The only proof I had was that that flag was there. What if someone walked up on the flagpole and put it up that night? And I mean, I can make a lot of excuses. We live with things we do not know. We live with scenes that, 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 that uh, we don't know ourselves. But what this is, we have the scriptures, we have the two witnesses who said Jesus was raised from the dead. And the disciples knowing this, when they were told, you should not speak about Jesus in this community again, Peter said, well, you can say what you want, but we will obey God rather than man. The freedom to say, I know, God made a promise to the disciples as you go and preach the gospel everywhere, I will be with you so that if you, if you share the gospel, make a, let me use the word again, Walmart. If you use the, the, the gospel in, in, in Walmart store, as an individual, and you are sharing not your faith, you're sharing the gospel. You're not telling people what Jesus means to you. That's a witness. Evangelizing is where you take the word of God, the gospel, and say, Jesus said. And your witness can lead to that. Please understand this. You are not alone. You are not alone. He promised that when you open the scripture to anyone, anywhere. <laughs> you know, that Ethiopian was on the road all alone and he was reading Isaiah 53 and he was getting frustrated because he didn't understand everything and God sent someone from another place miraculously to be with him and explain it to him because God takes responsibility for the sharing of his word. I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to let you take the sufferings for me. I have already suffered, but I want you to know that I'm with you when you're sharing the gospel with others. That's the motivation. The ascension is motivation. I'm not talking about a dead Christ. I'm talking about a living Lord who ever lives to make intercessions for us. And lastly, 
the ministry of the resurrection, of their ascension, is that it anticipates, it anticipates what I call this, the return of Jesus Christ. Look at what verse 11 says in Acts chapter 1. Verse 11 says this. They said to him, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking in the sky? This same Jesus that you see taken up before you into heaven will come again. I don't know about you, friends. And I, I won't be frivolous at all by saying certain things about Ikea. But this I will say, we need to have the sense that Jesus is coming again. We really do. Things are getting us discouraged. People are changing their religion because they don't see what is happening. They miss the scriptures. 2, 2 Peter chapter, um, uh, chapter 3 and verse 10 says, some men come slackness, think that's the way God says, but God is so patient. The reason he hasn't consumed this earth is because he wants you to repent. He wants you to trust in his salvation. And so the, 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 the angel said to him, he's coming again. And you serve, you live each day with the, hope, the fulfillment of this hope that he had. And listen to what the hope says. And if I go, I will return. And I will take you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. Dear friends, where we will be has no comparison on earth. Where we will be, listen to how John in the Revelation puts it. Our hope says this, all the former things are passed away. No more pains. I, I, I called my optometrist a few days ago and, and I said, you told me when I was, when I was getting my glasses that um, if you have any problems, don't hesitate to call me. And I said to him, I am not calling because I have a problem. I'm calling to thank you that I don't have one because these are the best glasses I've had in a long, long time. I'm not seeing four lights coming toward me when I'm driving. I'm not seeing double lights at the red lights. I mean, I don't, I don't even use my reading glasses anymore because what you promised is my, my experience. My friends, I can multiply that by eternity. When Jesus said, where I am, there you may be also, it means that nothing on earth can compare with what he has in glory for us. And as a result of that, we can live with excitement now because we know that things are not now what they ought to be, but the day will come when things will be as they should be and we will be a part of it because that is what God has promised us. I had a, the, just the closing verse of a hymn that I closed. It says this, the head that once was crowned with thorns, that is Jesus, is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the victorious, mighty, victor's brow. Jesus, who wore a crown of thorn on earth, is wearing a crown of glory in heaven, and he's asking you and me to anticipate that. And when he comes, we will share with him what he has promised to share with us in glory. Let's pray. Oh God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will take your word and drive the truth home to our hearts so that we will live 
a life of anticipation, hope, something this world knows nothing about. But Father, when we live with hope, we can face today because we know that tomorrow he may come and the former things will be passed away. So thank you for the ascension of Jesus and may we not live ignoring it ever again and live in its light and its hope until he comes and fulfill it in us as he fulfill it on the Father's behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your, well not take your books. I was watching a service and they say, turn to hymn number 435. I thought, oh my word, that's a, and it's, it was not an old fashioned church, it's a brand new church and they use the hymn books. But we will not do that, we'll use saying, yet not, yet not I through Christ. Please rise as we sing our closing song. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more of heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is only Savior, he will say, I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me, through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall It has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and never is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and until Jesus Christ comes again and then forevermore. Amen. God bless you and enjoy the rest of the day. May I just say a word that uh, Carl and Kathy uh, have returned. Dwayne and Pam are leaving. <laughs> They'll be gone until November. Mm -hmm. so until then. And um, we wish them Godspeed as they go and they will um, they, they all, when they leave, they usually meet with us online a time or two. Perhaps that will take place. And so we wish them Godspeed as they go. And I wish you Godspeed as you go. God bless you. <laughs>